There we go. <laughs> well, thank you for having me here this morning. Um, I understand that we have sort of a group birthday. The Galleons Mariner'ship is celebrating 45 years together. Yeah, why don't you guys stand up and we can kind of give you a clap. That's awesome. What a great model for community. Thank you guys for sticking together for so long. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> I mean, has it, been, has it been great and wonderful? Or has it been sort of like a marriage thick and thin and, you know, sort of better and worse at the same time? That's awesome. Well, this morning we're continuing through our series uh, in the book of Acts written by the gospel writer Luke. And um, we pick up today in Acts chapter 9. If you want to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 9, we're going to read a passage from there in just a few minutes. But I wanted to begin with a story of a man from the second century. Second century. Polycarp. Polycarp was a disciple of the disciple John. The, the, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the disciple who wrote the Gospel of John, Polycarp was his uh, student, his disciple. And uh, Polycarp, he was a, a very influential believer. The, the disciple John had ordained Polycarp to be the head of the church in a place called Smyrna. It was up kind of in uh, uh, ancient Turkey, Anatolia, on the coast of the Aegean Sea, sort of near Ephesus. And uh, he was very influential, very well loved. And, uh, uh, you know, at the time that this story takes place, Polycarp is 86 years old. Uh, Polycarp lived in a time when persecution of Christians was sort of sporadic. Uh, the, the Roman emperors, they, they, they didn't have sort of a, th a, th a full out system of persecution yet. But, uh, but they persecuted them on a whim, persecuted Christians on a whim. And uh, th these, one of the Roman emperors of the time, it was either Antonius Pius or Marcus Aurelius, they got wind of this disciple, this, this church leader named Polycarp. And uh, they wanted to get him to recant his faith. They wanted to, uh, the Caesar wanted to bring Polycarp in front of him in a big stadium in front of thousands of people and tell him, you better let go of Jesus or else we're going to let you go. <laughs> Well, Polycarp and his disciples, his own followers, got wind of this plot, and his disciples urged him, you better run for your life. Go, run for your life. And Polycarp said, okay, you know what, that's, that's a good idea. I, you know, I, I really, I, I don't need to stick around. Um, so, so he flies, he, he flees. And on the second or first or second night of his flight, he has a dream. He dreams that there's a, he, he's laying down in, in his bed and smoke is coming up from his pillow. Fire is coming up from his pillow. And he concludes from this dream. He wakes up and concludes, you know what? God is calling me to something rather difficult. I believe I'm going to stand before this Caesar, proclaim my faith in Jesus, my God, and I'm going to be martyred for it. So his captors come, the Roman captors that the Caesar has dispatched come, and he submits willingly to go with them. And he's on his way to this, to this stadium, and his captors, they understand what's about to happen to him. They know their emperor. They, so they try to urge him, Polycarp, you should, you, should not, you should just recant and be done with it. Then you can go back to your life and just be done with it. But he doesn't do it. They urge him even violently. This 86-year-old man, there's one account of him being pushed off of a horse. He's, he's 86 years old. He's an old man. But he doesn't recant. So he ends up in front of Caesar in a stadium, thousands of people. And the Caesar says, you must let go of your faith in Jesus. History records this conversation. Polycarp responds to this Caesar. For 86 years, I have been his servant, Jesus' servant, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king who saved me? You vainly suppose that I will swear by the genius of Caesar, as you request, and pretend not to know who I am. Listen carefully, Caesar. I am a Christian. Caesar replies, I have wild beasts. I will throw you to them unless you change your mind. Call for them. 
For the repentance from better to worse is a change impossible for us. But it is a noble thing to change from that which is evil to righteousness. Caesar responds, I will have you consumed by fire then. You will have to, or you threaten me with a fire that burns only briefly and after just a little while is extinguished. But why do you delay, Caesar? Come, do what you wish. Polycarp died that day. His faith fully intact. This 86-year-old man, abused on the way to his death, burned at the stake. Faith intact. This man was full of love and full of grace, and he was feisty too. He was a wonderful man. He was a strong believer. How can you hear this story and not have courage stirred up in you? I mean, can you hear this story and not think, wow, I want to be resolved like that man, 86 year old, eight years old, endured that? I can do that too then. Jesus would give me the strength I need to endure something like that if he gives him strength. Who hears whose faith is not stirred up by this kind of a story? That's what I want to talk about this morning. The power of a story to encourage and stir up faith in those who hear it. God uses testimony, stories of faith, stories of, of courage to encourage others toward faith in Jesus. When Polycarp died that day in front of thousands of, of witnesses, many people placed their faith in Jesus as a result of seeing this man die so bravely. Instead of extinguishing this movement, no, it, it caused it to flare up even more. God uses testimony, uses stories of journeys of faith and faithfulness to encourage others toward faith in Jesus. If you look at the main ideas that we've covered over the past two weeks, you see sort of a progression that takes place. Two weeks ago, we looked at a passage with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip demonstrated that, uh, that, that the good news about Jesus is spread by his committed followers. The good news about Jesus is spread by his committed followers. Philip, 40 miles away, gets word from an angel of the Lord, go south, and he goes. That's commitment, 40 miles on foot. Boom, let's do this. And then he risks his life getting close to this Ethiopian eunuch because he's a royal official and would have a guard. And if he was perceived as a threat, could have had his own safety threatened himself, for himself. Philip demonstrated that the good news about Jesus spreads through his committed followers. Then last week we saw the passage of Saul's conversion. And we saw that conversion is more than just lip service. Conversion is a life change. That's what it means. It means that we have one sort of operations manual that we're living by. And when we embrace Christ, rather when he arrests us on the, our roads that we're on, he swaps out that operations manual and puts his own in there, his very spirit. And this this change, this core essence change that happens works itself out, but conversion is not just about adding on spiritual disciplines or certain behaviors. Conversion is about a life change, a core essence change. So the good news about Jesus spreads through his committed followers, and conversion means this life change. So if you are a Christian and you have committed yourself to Jesus, and if you uh, have seen changes happen in you, and then if the good news about Jesus spreads through you committed followers of Jesus, how do we start sharing that news? How do we start spreading that good news about Jesus? The passage that we explore today helps us to answer that question, and it focuses on this main idea. That God uses testimony, stories of people's faith coming to Jesus, but also continuing life with Jesus. He uses those testimonies to encourage others toward faith in the Savior. Does that make sense so far? Wonderful. 
Well, let's look at Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through 43. Read with me, if you will. Acts chapter 9, verses 32 through 43, starting at verse 32. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take care of your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas. How would you like that name? <laughs> she was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once, please. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and he prayed. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes. And seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and the widows and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa. And many people believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. There are a couple of elements in this story that I'd like to pull out for us this morning. They're, they're elements of how God interrupts or brings somebody to faith in Jesus. And then I want to wrap up by showing how God uses these things in the lives of other people to encourage them toward faith. The first element that God uses to bring somebody to him is providential relationships. Providential relationships. Look with me, if you would, at verse 32 through 33. Luke writes, As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas. The last time that we saw Peter, he was in Samaria with a guy named Simon the sorcerer. But that was the first time that Peter had sort of gotten out of Jerusalem. But God had coordinated this movement of Peter around the country to bring him to this man, Aeneas, to bring about this experience of God's grace in his life. God coordinated this relationship between Aeneas and Peter for God to glorify himself. God's pro providence in the making, the orchestrating all these relationships becomes clear when we look at what happens with Tabitha. So Lydda, where... where um, Aeneas died, was close to Joppa. Lydda was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men and urged him, please come at once. God orchestrated all these events. The news about Aeneas, his, his, his legs being healed after being bedridden for eight years, it spreads all over and it spreads to this place, Joppa. And God had positioned Peter perfectly to be able to respond to this situation of crisis and grief and potentially even despair. He positioned Peter perfectly. He, had the, he formed this providential relationship between the community that was in Joppa and Peter, just like he had done with the people, with Aeneas, who was in Lydda. God uses providential relationships providential relationships to help stir up faith in people and encourage others toward faith in Jesus. Mentioning it briefly, real quickly, and then we'll move on. God has placed you in the lives of people providentially for the purpose of stirring up faith in others. 
All of you have relationships that God has orchestrated for the purpose of moving others who are not yet saved closer and closer to Jesus. God uses providential relationships to stir up faith in Jesus. Secondly, he uses pivotal experiences. There, Peter found a man named Aeneas who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. And immediately, Aeneas got up. Think about this for a minute. Aeneas had been bedridden for eight years years. That's a long time. That's a really long time. I've had surgery a couple of times and had to be in bed for a few days. I was going crazy after a few days. How many of you have gone, had to stay in bed for a few days and just gone stir crazy because you want to be up and around? A lot of us, I'm sure. This man had been in bed for eight long years. He had to learn how to depend on people for bringing him his food and not to be too graphic, but to help him use the facilities to hear about uh, what's going on in the community from other people. This man had become accustomed to being in bed for eight years. He probably had to figure out ways to keep from going crazy and to entertain himself. But when Peter comes and says, Jesus Christ heals you and he gets up, that's something called a pivotal experience. (laughs) Something changes in your whole scheme and everything that's going on around you. Now he can get up and enjoy the outdoors for himself. He can feed himself. I mean, he can do, I mean, this is something that's pivotal. He's changed. And it's not just this, this, some change that happens. It's a change that is linked to God's grace. This is a pivotal experience with God's grace in his life. His life is changed. The same happens with with Tabitha and the community there. Peter, he sent all of the people out of the room that were in the upper room where Tabitha's body was, was laid. He sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed, turning toward the dead woman. He said, Tabitha, get up. That, you know, if you think about it, Those words are really similar to Jesus when he speaks to the little girl. He says, Talitha, kum. This is Tabitha, kum. This is Tabitha, get up. This This is an echo of Jesus. Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. If there's something called a pivotal experience in somebody's life, this is it. (laughs) Dead and alive. Your mind starts to shift after that. What's possible and who is doing to it and the trust that you have and who is doing that to you, that changes a little bit. That is a pivotal experience. Pivotal. And it wasn't just pivotal for Tabitha, but it was pivotal for the whole community of believers that knew the story. They saw this woman dead. They had washed her body. They were preparing to lay her into the ground or into a tomb. And they see her get up and walk out. That is pivotal. I'm changing. I got to reconsider some things here. That is a pivotal experience. God uses pivotal experiences of his grace to stir up faith in people and the lives of the people who experience it directly. But God also uses that to to stir up the faith in the people who know the story. God didn't just use miracles. He used stories and the results of miracles to stir up faith in people. In the case of Aeneas, all those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him, that is Aeneas, up and walking now, who had been bedridden for eight years. They saw him and turned to the Lord. These guys didn't just see it. I mean, they, saw, they didn't see the miracle happen itself, but they saw the results of the miracle. They saw the before and after and concluded, Jesus has done this. 
I'm not just open to miracles I, I, now. I, I'm not just open to the fact that Jesus might be God. I am now going to entrust myself to this Jesus because they saw the incredible transformation that had taken place and news about it spread. God uses stories, testimonies of God's grace experienced to stir up faith in those who know the story and who hear the story and who can see the before and after. It's the same in the case of Tabitha. Her resuscitation, this became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. Many people believed in the Lord. They saw, the, the, there were people who didn't even necessarily b see the before and after that, that she had been dead and that was raised. They just heard about it. News about it spread. And that acted as, the people who heard it, that acted as their pivotal experience. This changes everything. I need to reconsider some stuff. God used the testimony of his grace in transforming people to stir up saving faith in people, in those who heard, in those who knew the story. God uses providential relationships to stir up faith. God uses pivotal experiences in our lives to stir up faith and in the lives of other people. But it isn't just those things. Sometimes it's enough just to hear about those things happening in the lives of other people. And God uses that to stir up faith, to think, I, I want that for me, and I think that's possible for me. I want to place my trust in Jesus. God uses all those things to stir up faith. God uses testimony, the story of your journey, to encourage others toward faith in Jesus. That's what this means for you. If you are here today and you are a believer in Jesus and you've had your life transformed, if you have experienced salvation and forgiveness of sin, however seemingly insignificant or however egregious, if you have been saved by placing your faith in Jesus, been changed by placing your, tr your trust in Jesus, you have a story. You have a testimony of God shedding his grace in your life. However dramatic of a transformation or however quiet, if you've experienced change and transformation on any level by placing your trust in Jesus, you have a story. And God wants you to share it. God wants it to be ready on your lips to give to people because you have no idea if your story is going to be the thing that pushes them over to the threshold of faith. You have no idea. The, res the responses to our stories, uh, to our sharing, that's not up to us. We're not held responsible for whether or not somebody comes ultimately to salvation because of our story and our sharing the good news. We're just called to share. God is the one who is responsible for those things. We just share the good news. We share our story. So bringing it back, if our lives have been changed by Jesus, and if the good news about Jesus spreads through you, committed followers of Jesus, then what is the jumping off point? Your story. Your story is that jumping off point. God wants to use your story to help move others toward faith in his son, in the savior, the one who died on a cross to take our sin, the one who took it all, who died and then was raised again and promises to raise our bodies physically back to life again at some point in the future, to live forever. God wants to use your story. That's the takeaway for this morning. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says that we should always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give, the, to give a reason for the hope that you have. To always be prepared. You have placed your hope in Jesus and experienced the transforming power of grace who have experienced the, the, the shift in your perspective of joy and hope, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, you have a story. 
You need to be prepared to share it. That is the response to hearing this word this morning. We need to be prepared to share that story with everyone who would ask us in the midst of our relationships. So here's what that looks like. Here's what it looks like to be prepared with your story. First of all, you need to reflect on God's involvement in your life. Some morning, you know, or some evening, get a cup of coffee or a pot of coffee, grab your pencil, grab your journal. I like a lot of coffee, by the way. It's my blood type. (laughs) (laughs) Grab a pencil, grab your journal, and think about, reflect on God's involvement in your life. Not just you coming to faith, though that's important, not just you coming to a faith in Jesus, but, but on how you have been transformed by Jesus through all these years of following him. That is part of your story and your testimony. And it's a testament to God's walking with us and persistent involvement in our lives, not to let us go unwork, or unfinished as works of his grace, but he promises to bring to completion everything, all the good works that he started in us. But reflect on God's involvement in your life in bringing you to faith and holding you in faith. Holding on to Jesus. Reflect on God's involvement in your life. Second, prepare a short, 100 to 200 word, testimony. <laughs> Is that kind of a laugh coming from a pastor? <laughs> kind of wordy? And... But prepare a short testimony. You know, reflect, when you're reflecting, think about the, the providential relationships, the relationships that God used to move you toward Jesus. Think about the pivotal experiences. Maybe it was a, some kind of an event, you know? Maybe it was a, a, a Billy Graham crusade. Maybe it was a youth pastor who taught you something. Um, m- maybe it was a crisis, you know? But think about the, the key relationships and the key experiences. And then think about how you were before Jesus— And think about your disposition continuing with Jesus or after Jesus. I don't want to say after because we don't really move beyond Jesus ever. Thank you, Lord. But think about your dispositions before, with, and during during your relationship with Jesus. And include your before and after dispositions. Prepare a short testimony. It's really important to include a before and after because these days people want to see that trusting in Jesus works. I don't need to tell you that uh, our culture is not all that consumed with needing to know the truth about something. If we like something, let's just call that truth. It's not about truth necessarily. What we believe is true, but it also works. Talk it when you think about and prepare your short testimony. Include before and after demonstrating this trust that I have in Jesus, it works. Reflect on God's involvement. Prepare a short testimony. And thirdly, understand, or excuse me, share your story with people. Understand that God has placed you in the life of somebody who is not yet saved. Somebody who is going to hell. God has placed you in their life to help move them steps closer to saving faith, to eternal life through trusting in his son, Jesus. Understand that your story could push somebody over that threshold of faith. Share your story. Prepare your story. Reflect on God's experience or God's experience of grace in your life. Share your story with people. And finally, ask other people their story. God uses testimony and stories uh, and journeys of our faith to, to, to encourage others toward faith in Jesus. But you know what? We who already trust that Jesus is God and have been forgiven, our faith gets stirred up by hearing stories. How many of you found some kind of encouragement to, to, to hold on a little bit longer by hearing the story of Polycarp? I mean, how many of you had courage stirred up in you, faith stirred up in you from hearing that? It's asking others their story stirs up faith in us. Reflect on God's involvement in your life. Write it down. Think of the key experiences. Think of the key people. Prepare a short testimony. Share your story with people and ask others their story.
If God has changed your life, and if the good news about Jesus spreads through you committed followers, then how do we go about doing that? We go about doing that by sharing our personal experiences of God's grace. Our personal experience that witnesses to objective realities and grace for all people who will accept it. That's how the good news spreads, by sharing what we've experienced of Jesus and his grace. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, you sit enthroned in heaven and thunderbolts come from your throne and the 24 elders and angels sing praise to you, God. You are the creator of the universe. There is no one like you, God. Would you, comp would you please continue to show us your will for our lives and give us the grace to realize it? Thank you for your word. Thank you for the grace, the saving grace that you have given to all who have placed their trust in Jesus. God, would you cause us to remember those key experiences of your grace and those key people who helped move us toward you and let that stir up gratitude in our hearts and excitement about sharing those stories however dramatic or quiet with those in our lives, knowing that as we do so, you are moving people closer and closer to your son, Jesus. God, use us, we pray. Use our stories, our testimonies, we pray, to glorify yourself through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.